The British Museum says it's negotiating what it calls a cultural exchange with Greece to return the Elgin marbles. Also known as the Parthenon sculptures, the ancient works of art have been on display in London for more than 200 years. But their presence is a diplomatic flashpoint amid claims and counterclaims about how Britain got hold of them in the first place. So, are the Elgin marbles heading home? And should cultural artifacts always be sent back to their place of origin? Welcome to the programme, I'm Philip Hampshire. Greeks have long complained about losing their marbles, the sculptures which graced the Parthenon in Athens for two and a half thousand years. They were brought over by Lord Elgin, who claimed that he saved them from destruction, while Greeks claimed that he committed blatant theft. This debate is not limited to treasure from just Greece, though. For example, around 90% of Africa's cultural heritage is thought to be outside the continent, and there are constant demands that the artifacts have returned. In fact, the US, Dutch, and German governments have all recently returned items from their museum collections. So the question is, should they have? And is the displaying of cultural treasures the outcome of colonial pillage or simply preservation? Joining our discussion here in London, we have Alexi K. Campbell. He's a playwright and scriptwriter and also a member of the British Committee for the Reunification of the Parthenon Marbles. And we have Tatiana Flessas. She is an associate professor of cultural heritage law at the London School of Economics. Meanwhile, in Edinburgh, we have Tiffany Jenkins, who's author of Keeping Their Marbles, How the Treasures of the Past Ended Up in Museums and Why They Should Stay There. Well, before I come to uh, the three of you, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, just to get all the viewers on the same page because many of them might think the Parthenon marbles, the Elgin marbles, what exactly are those, especially if they're not familiar with the debate. So uh, let's run through exactly what they are. In 1801, Lord Elgin was Britain's ambassador to the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople, and he said that he saved the marbles by taking them to Britain. However, the Greeks say that they were stolen by hacking the marbles from the walls of the ancient temple. This would be the frieze, the stone frieze around the top of the Parthenon. Because he had a divorce to pay for, the aristocrat then went on to sell them to the British government in 1816, which housed the precious artifacts in the British Museum, where they remained to this day. And while many experts argue that the Greeks have demanded the marbles back more or less since the day they were sent to Britain, it was 1983 that the Greek government formally asked the UK uh, to return them, and they listed their dispute with UNESCO. So if we can start off, Alexi, I'm going to pass across to you first, if I may. This debate has been rumbling on for well, almost 200 years, almost the best part of 200 years. So I guess the question is, if they're going to be returned to Greece. Why now? Why is the debate back in the headlines now? And why is there actually some traction being made for the first time, Alexi? Well, as you rightly pointed out, I mean, Greeks have been uh, requesting for the return of the marbles for, I think, since 1830 was the first request. And again, as you rightly pointed out, for the last 40 years, there's been a very concerted effort uh, by the Greek government and uh, by the Committee for the Reunification to try and get them repatriated. But recently, uh, as you well know, there's been a lot of uh, news about this story because uh, the current government of uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis has been in conversations behind closed doors uh, with the uh, chairman of the British Museum and uh, George Osborne. And there have been lots of, you know, uh, there's been a lot of guesswork about what these uh, conversations have been around. But the subject is ultimately coming to some sort of agreement for the eventual and uh, long overdue reunification. Tatiana, if I can cross to you, um, can we place a valuation on the Elgin marbles or the Parthenon marbles, or are they priceless? Are they totally without any basis in, we can't put a price on them because nothing else like this exists? Well, that's a difficult question. They have never been valued economically. They are unique and magnificent works of art. You know, does anything else like it exist? Not really. The point of cultural heritage is that it is priceless to a particular culture. 
And um, I think that whatever our other concerns are, I think everyone who is watching this or everyone who um, who's on this panel would agree that the Parthenon marbles are a really unique case. Tiffany, I'm going to come across to you in a second, uh, if I can, to uh, ask your opinion on this. But first, I'm going to put it to Alexi. Alexi, uh, if you're at the... Uh, uh, you are in favour of returning the Parthenon marbles to Greece. I think that's the best way to put it. Um, can you briefly explain why? Very passionately so. Uh, they are... Primarily, they're uh, an integral part of a larger monument of one of the most iconic buildings in the world, the Parthenon. Uh, and it is this, really, this fact uh, that will throw some cold water on arguments that uh, the can of worms argument that has recently been used by the British government to try and stop it from ha uh, stop the reuni reunification from happening. What I mean is that these monuments are not separate works of art. They were part of uh, the Parthenon and they were taken off it. They need to be seen with that monument from which they were prized. Um, and, you know, it's just uh, a, a simple question of justice, really. Um, they are part of Greek heritage, Greek civilization. They need to be seen uh, in the country from which they were first um, taken. Tiffany, I'm going to cross to you. I'm assuming you are opposed to returning the Elgin marbles or the Parthenon marbles to Greece. Yes, I am. I mean, I was in Athens this summer and I went to the Acropolis Museum and it is a wonder of the world, which is where they would go back to. And in the context of that museum, you see pre-classical Greece and then the great triumph that the Parthenon actually is. Um, I think they also tell a different story in the British Museum where they have been for 200 years. And that is, you can see them in the context of other civilizations. You can look at the Assyrians, the Egyptians, and that also tells a very important story about their uniqueness. So if you ask me, where is best for the object? It is actually split between the two. Alexi makes a convincing argument or a persuasive argument about the integrity of the monument, but ultimately I think they tell two really important stories split. Tatiana, um, if, if I can cross to you here, is there any precedent for this? Is there any precedent for people returning objects like this back to a country from which they were... And we, could, we have to be very careful about our language here because obviously whether you use the word plundered or whether you use the word were gifted from, uh, the phrase were gifted from, depends on which side of the debate you stand on. Yes, there's a lot of precedent. Um, the Benin bronzes have just been returned from the Horniman Museum back to Nigeria. Other objects are returned either um, completely, sort of openly, or as, you know, under the language of a long-term loan and in exchange for other objects. Uh, governments and museums enter into these agreements quite often. I think, I think that the issue in this case, though, is one where the objects have such great importance for both, in a sense, sides of the dispute because they're definitional or iconic, really, for both sides. Tiffany, if I can cross back to you, uh, the general debate uh, was alluded to by Alexi earlier. If someone says, well, the El Elgin marble should be returned, the usual counter-argument that comes through from the other side is the thin end of the wedge argument. Well, if we return this one item, how many other items are going to have to be returned? Is it next going to be Cleopatra's needle from the South Bank, uh, from the uh, North Bank of the Embankment in London? Is it? Are we going to have to return a bunch of paintings that come out of the various different art galleries that there are in the UK? The Louvre in France, if France started returning various different items, the Louvre would be empty. So are you a supporter of the thin end of the wedge argument, or do you look at this from other perspectives? Um, I think... I don't think it would necessarily um, create an opening of the door and the flooding out. That's not, that's not really where I am I'm coming from, no. But I do think we have to ask, or rather it does ask the question, what is a museum for? And do you just want museums that have objects from the local geographical area? Or do you want them that show artifacts from all over the world together? Now, the way I see it is that we can have both. Um, and I think sometimes the demands for repatriation perhaps 
threaten the idea of what people call an encyclopedic museum as a concept. Well, uh, Mario uh, Trabuccio uh, della Torretta, who is a classical archaeologist, he's one of uh, the people who is also vehemently opposed to uh, the Parthenon marbles returning, had this to say. We should establish a principle. In the principle we should establish is, does the value of the cultural heritage override the value of maintaining the property right? And we should establish this as a society. And this is extremely important because uh, right now I'm in Florence and I'm, I, I presume that the Florentine people would be very, very happy to see the Honda, the, the, the Mona Lisa, coming back on these particular principles. If we decide that the, the legal uh, acquisition of, by, by the French king, uh, um, Francis II, uh, uh, of uh, the painting from themselves that counts for nothing. And we decide, no, you know what? The context of the Mona Lisa, it's actually Florence and Florentine art of the 14th, uh, uh, the 15th century. So uh, th 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 that's why it's so important that we put these uh, into a much wider uh, systemic logic. And that's why the slippery slope argument, it's not limited to the British Museum. It's not like, oh, okay, yes, if they uh, ask for the part of marbles back, then they're going to get also the Rosetta Stone, they're going to get also the Moais, they're going to get also the drum, etc. It's, it's, it's not just a British museum. It's about the Louvre, it's about the Metropolitan Museum, it's about every museum, the Egyptian Museum in Turin. Are we, are, are we just saying, okay, yeah, just pack it up and put it back to Cairo? Alexi. Well, there is, there is, there is a slight concern here, as you mentioned. There, there's a slippery slope argument, an opening the door, a can of worms argument. It is a very common one to place. So, how do you counter that? Well, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, I mean, these are separate. This is a very unique case. There are hundreds of thousands of Greek artifacts from antiquity in museums around the world. The Greeks are not asking for any of those to be returned. I believe there are over 108,000 in the British Museum alone. The Greeks for 40 years now have over and over again uh, attempted and continue to attempt uh, to have just this one, you know, the, the Parthenon marbles returned to, to the Parthenon. Uh, it, it separates this argument from all the rest that are going on. And it's, it's a tired argument. And, and it's, you know, as I say, it's slightly disingenuous. Um, so, so this case has to be seen separately from all the other ones. The ones, for instance, the Mona Lisa was just cited, or Cleopatra's Needle, they're separate works works of art, you know. Um, so you'd be in favour of, say, a case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, absolutely. Every case is an independent case. I mean, the arguments about whether things should be returned uh, to, to countries from which they were looted uh, by, by, by past, uh, you know, uh, during the time of colonialism, that is a very, that's an argument and a conversation that has to happen. Um, and rightfully so at this point in history. But but I do want to stress that the case of the Parthenon marbles is completely exceptional. Um, and, you know, for many years, both the British government and the British Museum have looked for a myriad of reasons uh, to, to sort of postpone the reunification. Uh, for many years, their main argument was that Greece didn't have the right place uh, to, to, to house them in. And actually, I'm half British, half Greek, so I see both sides of the argument. And to be honest with you, for many years, I was sort of pretty much on the fence because I saw the validity of that argument. But when, uh, as Tiffany just pointed out, you have this sort of exquisite museum built, which, by the way, has over three million visitors a year. So it, it, it is a very significant uh, a museum. When when that was built and the top floor is is there waiting for the return of the marble so they can be seen in relationship with the monument from which they were taken, you know those arguments just disintegrate. I'm afraid. You know this this is a a very exceptional case and actually the British Museum and the British government could very if they decide to do the right thing and I believe they will. I believe they will uh, sooner or later, preferably sooner. They can stipulate that. You know, that can be part of the return is this is an exceptional case because these pieces of art were taken from 
this very iconic monument. Tatiana, um, you're an expert in cultural heritage law, so I suppose the, the question around the Elgin marbles is, if there is a dispute, which there is between Britain and Greece, whose law prevails over it? I mean, a lot of international relations is sort of made up on the spot, as it were, but is this something for Greece to take to the UN, uh, to the ECJ, or for Greece to take to the European Court of Human Rights, or for it to take to the UN? How do you deal with a case like this? Whose legal purview is it under? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, think, I think I'm going to say something which is not, a, it's not, um, it's not in my best interest, but I'm not sure law has law has the answer here. And the reason is this: there are sort of three ways of thinking about what the legal situation is. One way is to think about how the acquisition of these artifacts occurred. And when we look at that, we see that they occurred under, as was pointed out earlier, a situation where they came from a country that was um, occupied by an opposing sort of you know culture for a long time and the culture which allowed the government which allowed Elgin's ag agents to take the marbles was not friendly to the Greeks in fact the permission itself might well be flawed for all kinds of reasons there's some interesting now Turkish academics who are saying that maybe that original permission doesn't really doesn't really hold. But um, so one thing that people have done for a really long time is litigate the past. But you can't litigate the past. You can't litigate the past either with this, the, the international cultural property laws that exist, which are international conventions that are non-retroactive, and nor can you lit litigate the past with like principles of good title or you know, fair transfer. So is it purely and down to I, diplomacy? Well, I think that there, there, there is a place for law. I think that if we can start from now, if we can start from ideas of reunification and exceptionalism, instead of illegal originary transfer and floodgates, that there are so many things that can be done. I mean, law is just a tool. We can make it do anything, really. Let's it's listen to the Greek Prime Minister. Uh, the Greek Prime Minister had this to say on the subject. He said uh, the following. There has now been a significant change in the United Kingdom, both at the level of public opinion, but also at the level of people who have knowledge of the matter from the entire political spectrum, who openly argue in favor of the need for the reunion of the Parthenon marbles. Tiffany, do you feel like the argument for keeping the marbles is losing this battle, is losing this war. I've been uh, thinking about and arguing over this question for a number of years, and the one thing I found is that it's very volatile. So in 2016, and after both the Brexit vote and also Neil McGregor's kind of the previous director's operation at the museum, people were much more ambivalent and much more pro-keeping them. And now it has flipped over. And I, flip, I think it's flipped over partly because of the movements around post-George Floyd and Black Lives Matters, but also because I think museums are somewhat on the back foot and they're finding it very difficult to explain why they exist and what they're for. Um, at the moment, I don't think the Tory government, who would have to pass a bill, are receptive, but they may not be in power for much longer. Uh, a Labour Party may come in and they may be more open to it. Tatiana's right, the, the law could change quite easily if they wanted to do it. They've done so in the past. What um, advocates of return need to do is persuade the public and, and they're having some sway at the moment. Alexi, um, we mentioned already the Parthenon marbles are in a slightly special case. Uh, nonetheless, there's still a small amount of validity to this, so I'm going to put it to you. If we take the case of Cleopatra's needle, the reason that that uh, particular architectural monument is famous is because it is in London, 
while it was over in uh, while it was over in Egypt in Alexandria, I think it was, or just outside Alexandria, it was simply an item that was buried in the sand. Nobody particularly wanted it. Um, it was offered by uh, the Sultan to the UK. It sat there still in the sand for several decades, and then eventually they shipped it back to the UK. It's the standard story that's generally told about it. But the reason that it's famous and you would want it repatriated is because it's now sat in London for 100 years and people have seen it and know what it is. Is there a similar argument to be made in favour of things like the Elgin Marbles? The only reason that people are interested in them is because they're controversial. They've become famous. Same as the Mona Lisa, nobody didn't care about it until after 1910 when it was stolen in France. No, well, again, I mean, the the Parthenon is one of the most famous buildings in the world. And actually, if you did a poll uh, across the world, uh, I'm sure that uh, the great majority of people would know exactly where the Acropolis is, but very few would know the marbles, necessarily. I mean, people in this country know the marbles and people in Greece. But if you were to do a, a, a global poll, you'd find that everybody would know the Acropolis. So actually, uh, that's another argument for reuniting them, because they'll be they'll be they'll they'll sort of have a wider audience in that respect because they will be attached to that very famous building um and you know finally i, I just want to add one more thing you know um all these arguments have been going on for such a long time and uh, i think tiffany and i were once on 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 a chat on a on a board together talking uh but the fact is that you know to misquote uh martin luther king uh you know, the arc of history does lean towards justice. And this, as I said in my opening argument, I mean, this is this is a question of, of simple justice, really. They need to go back. And uh, I just urge, I mean, Tatiana and, and T Tiffany both, I, I'll echo what they said about laws being, being able to change. They do change when there's political uh, will and where there's a moral will. And there are, we have both of those in this country now. I mean, the, the great majority of people in Britain support the reunification. And that's very important. You know, it's it, uh, aspires to the best part of being British, which is fair play, doing the right thing. Tatiana, there, there, is a, um, there is a social justice argument here, isn't there? That it's got to be returned simply from a justice standpoint. Yeah, of course there is. I mean, the thing about, and I know that both, um, both of the other guests have made this point also, the thing about particular pieces of cultural heritage or cultural property is that they're not everything. They're not all the things that are in museums or that are in galleries or that are in public squares. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, no one has ever requested the return of the Mona Lisa, ever. And the reason is that it's fully understood as an artwork that's properly in the Louvre through a proper chain of title. And no matter how much you know, maybe people would like to have it in a more accessible place in Italy to look at it, no one has ever suggested that it should actually move. Um, the same with many, many other artifacts from many other countries. But when there is a particular object or artifact that constellates questions of identity and history and conflict, and that actually brings people to a particular institution to see it, people who identify it as being their own in some way, then that's a really different situation. I don't think it can be lumped in with um, the sort of traditional or typical floodgate arguments. And um, I do think there's a social justice question, the same way there is a social justice question about the return of um, uh, Aboriginal human remains, which England did in 2004, or the return of cultural objects, uh, Holocaust Act for things that were looted during during the Nazi era. Canadians you know, did something similar, so, I think, with indigenous tribes there too. Uh, if I can quickly uh, bring that across though, uh, Tiffany, uh, last word if I can across to you. The social justice argument is very powerful one, especially in the current cultural environment. So what's the best position for people who take your standpoint that they shouldn't return? How do you combat such a powerful argument? I think two ways. One is to think about what the value of museums are. Um, I think they open up 
the pass to millions and millions of people. The British Mu Museum has free entry, six to seven million go every year. And they better understand human civilization by going and looking at these objects in depth. And they better understand ancient Athens, which is something that I think we all three really agree um, was a, a, a absolute triumph, um, artistic and political. Um, I think that's the first argument. The second is to question if we can make amends to the past and the present. And I don't think we can. I don't think we can undo harms that have been done. I think we need to be much more future orientated and think about social justice in the present rather than, as Tatiana described it, litigating the past. Well, Alexi, Tatiana, Tiffany, thank you very much, all three of you, for joining me today, agreeing to talk about this subject. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and all of the team, goodbye. And thank you for watching.